Today in class, I'm going to show you how to set up a very important problem in physics called the two body problem. And this uh, problem has applications in things like orbital mechanics and uh, scattering of particles. So two body problem, you have two separate masses, M1 and M2. And they're located, let's say that we define our origin here. They're located at position R2 and R1. And so the distance between these two things is R1 minus R2. And we're going to define that length to be the vector R. And so that's the orientation of the two body problem. And the interesting physics of this is that these two masses can interact with each other. So for orbital mechanics, you have gravitational interaction between these two things. And for something like electron scattering, you have uh, Coulomb force interacting, interaction between the particles. But we're going to solve this for a general potential uh, for this setup. OK, but just know that there is some kind of interaction. So there's an interaction force between M1 and M2. Okay, and so if we wanted to write down the Lagrangian of this thing in Cartesian coordinates, and so remember, these R vectors are really just whatever x position plus y, maybe I'll do x, y, and z. And so if you wanted to write the Lagrangian of this thing in Cartesian coordinates, so if we wanted to look at this Lagrangian in Cartesian coordinates, we have one half m1 times the velocity of mass one, which we'll just call r1 dot. And then we have m2 times r2 dot squared minus the potential with respect to R1 and R2. And so remember this R1 is the vector composed of x1, y1, and z1. And same with R2 composed of x2, y2, Z2 dots on all of those and R1, 
x1, y1, z1, r2, x2, y2, z2. So because we have x1, y1, z1, x2, y2, and z2, dot or undot, that's going to be six degrees of freedom. Three from each mass. And so if we wanted to try to solve this Lagrangian, it would be very difficult. We would have to do uh, six different Euler-Lagrange equations and solving that is not trivial. So what can we do? So one thing that we can do is define the center of mass of the system. One of the ways that we can do that is by defining the center of mass of the system. So this red point is the center of mass. And the center of mass, we're going to label with the vector R, capital R. And capital R is defined as the M1 times R1 plus M2 times R2 over the sum of M1 plus M2. And so you can think of the center of mass as kind of the weighted average of the masses of the system. And so this is the formula for two masses, but you could just add on M3 plus R3 on top and then add an M3 on the bottom and so on and so forth if you have more, uh, more masses in your problem. But we're focusing on the two body problem, so we only have two, um, two masses to deal with. So now that we've defined the center of mass, we have this vector capital R, which is M1 plus M1 R1 plus M2 R2 over M1 plus M2. And we also have our definition of R, that is R1 minus R2. So now we're gonna do some math to manipulate these two equations so that we can rewrite our Lagrangian in a simpler form. And so what that's going to look like is the following. So we start with these two equations. And so first I'm going to solve this R1 equation, or this uh, R lowercase r equation for both R1 and R2 in two separate streams. So on the left, we'll solve for R1, which equals R plus R2. And on the right, we have R2 equals R1 minus R. Okay, so we'll just treat these one at a time. So now that we have this 
solve for R1, let's go into our R equation and substitute the R1 in that equation for this R1 that we just solved for. So that becomes R capital R equals M1 times R plus R2 plus M2 R2 over M1 plus M2. So if you distribute the M1, you get the following. Now, if we group everything that has an R2 together and factor out the R2, we get R2 times M1 plus M2. And now there's an M1, M2 on the bottom. So the one on the top will be canceled out and you get M1 R times, or divided by M1 plus M2 plus R2 by itself. Okay. So solving this for R2, we get capital R minus M1R over M1 plus M2. So now we'll do the same kind of thing for this right-hand side, where we replace now the R2 instead of the R1. So this there. And the math will look pretty similar. We'll distribute the M2 Factor out the M1. Factor out the R1, not the M1. Do some cancellation. And you get this equation, which we can solve for R1, which is capital R plus M2 little r over M1 plus M2. OK, so now we've got these two equations. We'll take derivatives of those, and then we'll plug them into our Lagrangian. And so the derivatives aren't too complicated. R2 equals R minus R times M1. And so doing the dot of this is just so I'm going to stop writing the vector symbols uh, because I have to write the dots over things, but just know that all of the R's are vectors here. So this is R dot, capital R dot minus M1 little r dot over M1 plus M2. And then R1, that's capital R plus M2, R, M1 plus M2. Take the time derivative of that, which gives you 
capital R dot, M2 lowercase r dot over M1 plus M2. Okay, so now if you remember our Lagrangian, and maybe I'll write it down at the bottom. Our Lagrangian was M1, M2, R1 dot squared plus M2 over two, R2 dot squared minus the potential with respect to R1, R2. So we don't need just the R dot, we need the R1 and R2 dot squared. So R1 dot squared. So we'll have to FOIL this. So the first term squared and the last term squared. And then the cross term, which is two capital R dot, lowercase r dot, M2 over M1 plus M2. And so this is going to get plugged in down there. And then squaring R2 dot, we get R capital R dot squared minus M1. Uh, this will be plus when we square it. M1 squared R dot squared. M1 plus M2 squared. And then the cross term, two R dot, capital R dot, lowercase R dot, M1 over M1 plus M2. And that is going to get plugged into there. So let's do that. So we started with this Lagrangian. Let me rewrite these derivatives. R two dot is R dot squared plus M one squared R squared dot one plus m two squared and then minus the cross term and then r one dot squared basically the mirror image of that one. And we're plugging it into this Lagrangian. So plugging in the R1, we get one half M1 times this whole thing. Plus one half and two times this whole thing. And then we've got our potential 
And so I'm going to start writing that in terms of just R, because we have the relationship that R, lowercase r, is just R1 minus R2. All right, so now when we start distributing things out, so I'm just going to pull a one half out in front because everything is multiplied by one half. And now we get m1 r dot squared from the first term. And we'll have an m2 r capital R dot squared from the second term. Then distributing the m1 to the second term of the r one dot term, we get m1 m2 squared r dot squared over m1 plus 2 squared. Then if we do the same for the other term, we get m1 squared times m2 lowercase r dot squared over m1 plus m2 squared. And then we'll get for the last term in each of these m1, m2, capital R dot, lowercase r dot, m1 plus m2. And then we'll just get the negative of that. And so they'll cancel nicely. Okay, so you see that these two terms are just negatives of each other, so they'll cancel. For the first term, I can factor out the r dot squared term. And that gives me r dot squared times m1 plus m2. Now from these two terms in the middle, both of them have an M1, M2, and they both have an M1 plus M2 squared, and they both have an R dot squared. And so all that's left is an M1 plus M2 that's factored out. And the m1 plus m2 on top can cancel with one of the squared m1, m2s on the bottom. And you see that we're left with a much simplified version of our Lagrangian. Right. And so now what we've done is we've broken the Lagrangian into, so we started with having the motion be with respect to M1 and M2. And now instead we have motion with respect to the center of mass or motion of the center of mass of the system, which is capital R. And then the motion of the system with respect to the center of mass, which is this little r. So you might think that we've kind of just traded um, one set of degrees of freedom for another, but in this form, there are some interesting things that we can see. So this is our new form.
So the first thing that we can see or that we'll do is that we're going to take this term with all the m's and we're going to define a new term called mu which is defined as just m1 m2 over m1 plus m2 and this is called the reduced mass of the system. Okay, so then our Lagrangian is mu times r dot squared minus b as a function of r. r dot squared. Okay, so now that we have this new term in there, just to make things, just to have less things to write down. Now, if we look at our Lagrangian, you'll see that the capital R doesn't appear in the potential. And it doesn't appear anywhere else in our Lagrangian. So because capital R does not appear. Or another way to say that is that R is cyclic. We are going to have a conserved quantity. And this goes back to Noether's theorem. And so if we wanted to find the Euler-Lagrange equation for capital R, we would do our uh, partial derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to capital R dot, we would get M1 plus M2 times R dot. And if you took the time derivative of that, you would get R double dot times M1 plus M2 but because there's no capital R term that appears when you write your Euler-Lagrange equation down, you just get R double dot times M1 plus M2 equals zero. So in the two body problem, there is, in Assuming no outside forces, only the self interaction between particle M1 and M2, or mass M1 and M2, uh, there's no acceleration of the system. And so this, so you get that from the Euler Lagrange. And what that's telling you is that this is a conserved quantity. And what that conserved quantity is, is just the total momentum of the system. So in a two body problem, the total momentum of the system is conserved. So now that we have seen that this capital R term is not going to influence our motion because there's no, uh, the center of mass doesn't appear in our potential or anywhere else in our Lagrangian. We can rewrite our Lagrangian just ignoring that term. And so we have mu r dot squared minus v as a function of r.
And now I'm going to rewrite the, the vector symbols in here because I'm going to do something that's maybe a little messy. And remember, this R vector is related to these two things. And we were these two vectors. And we remember that these vectors are just uh, representations of x1, y1, z1, and x2, y2, z2. So the way we have things written is still written in Cartesian coordinates because of this fact. So this all tells us that this is still in Cartesian coordinates. And so because this is in Cartesian coordinates, we can switch to a different coordinate system if we like. And I'm going to switch to the polar, polar coordinate system. And so the general Lagrangian for a polar coordinate system is one half m, and we'll just use mu in this case uh, because that's what it is up here. R dot squared plus um, R squared beta dot squared. Okay, so this is general. This is the general form. And the only thing we need to change for the two body problem is that we know that our potential only depends on the radial direction. So your potential energy doesn't depend on where you are in orbit. Okay, so this is for um, two body problem, which is what we're working on. And so it's just important to note that these lowercase r's are not the same. The r vector and r are different. So r vector is related to what's up here and r without the vector is the radial position in polar coordinates. So just a, a kind of an unfortunate um, thing that we use lowercase r for so many things, but just make sure that that distinction is clear. Okay. Now, by going into and so the reason I picked polar coordinate system is that because we only have two masses, so M1 and M2, no matter how you orient two mass, two points, you can always draw a, a, a straight line going through them or have a plane going through them. So plane or straight line. And so if you can have one plane on which both of those masses rest, 
then they won't, uh, their motion is constrained to be within that plane. So that's why we can write this in polar coordinate system instead of doing spherical coordinate system. So if these masses were free to move uh, outside of the plane that we can draw between them, then we would have to include that third term from spherical coordinates. But because uh, there's only two masses, we can always draw a plane between them. And because the uh, interaction between them is only in the radial direction, there will never be any motion in the outside of the plane of those two objects. Okay. Now, just like we saw in um, when we were looking at capital R dot, you'll notice that there's no theta term in the potential or anywhere else in our Lagrangian. So our Lagrangian as we have it now, one half mu, which is the reduced mass, r dot squared plus r squared theta dot squared minus b as a function of r. Now, if we take our derivatives with respect to theta dot, we get mu r squared theta dot And if you take the time derivative of that, you get zero, you get that mu r squared theta double dot equals zero. And so there's no uh, angular acceleration. And that tells you that this mu, mu r squared theta dot is a conserved quantity. And so because that's a conserved quantity, uh, let's just call it, um, let's give it a special name. Mu r squared theta dot is going to be lowercase l. So we're just defining that so as you look at this term on the left, you might notice that this is the angular momentum term. So r times theta dot, which is the angular momentum, is just the velocity. <coughs> and so we could write this term as mu times velocity, and then an r out in front, r cross e, or r cross mu times e, which is r cross p, which is the definition of angular momentum. And so we've written it as a lowercase l because we're dealing with this reduced mass term instead of the mass of just one particle. Uh, but so the conserved quantity that we just found is angular momentum. And again, because of Noether's theorem, we know that because this theta dot, this theta term was cyclic, we know that we get a conserved quantity and that conserved quantity happens to be angular momentum. Now, let's look at the Euler-Lagrange equation for the R term. Okay take the partial derivative with respect to r dot, get one 
you are the and then taking the time derivative of that you get r double dot the derivative of the Lagrangian with respect to r you'll get r squared the derivative of r squared which is r 2r, but then the one half will cancel out in front, theta dot squared minus the partial derivative of the potential with respect to r. And if you put that together in your Euler Lagrange, you get mu r double dot equals mu r theta dot squared minus this derivative of the potential. The next trick that we're going to use is that we're going to define a new potential called the effective potential. And that effective potential Effective potential is just going to be based on what we have on the left hand side of our equation. So before we take the derivative here, this is mu r squared theta dot squared over two minus b as a function of r. And that's what we're going to define our effective potential as. Now you'll remember we defined our angular momentum as mu r squared theta dot and so if we plug that into here. So we had this definition for L or the angular momentum. If we squared that, we would get mu squared r to the fourth theta dot squared. And we want to square it so that we have a theta dot squared term that we can plug into. So theta dot squared equals L squared over mu squared r to the fourth. So if we plug that in to theta dot squared, we get this. And now the mu squared will cancel with the mu up top and the r squared on top cancels with the r to the fourth on the bottom, leaving you with angular momentum squared over two mu r squared minus b as a function of r, b as a function of r. So that's our definition for v effective. And if we rewrite our Lagrangian now, we have mu r dot squared over two minus v effective, which is a function of r. So remember v effective was just L squared over two mu r squared minus v as a function of r. So L squared did have theta dot in it, but because L squared is a conserved quantity, it's going to be constant. So the L squared is constant, mu is constant. So the only thing that's varying is R and both terms have an R in it. So that's why we're writing V effective only as a function of R. Now, if you look at this Lagrangian, now we only have one degree of freedom. And that's, lowercase r, which again is the 
radial direction and polar coordinates. It's not the not this vector, which was R1 minus R2, different Rs. But the, the point is that we've now taken this um, two body problem, which had six degrees of freedom, and now we've uh, simplified it all the way down to one degree of freedom. So this will make a much easier problem to solve. So our next step will be to take this effective potential and actually plug in what this potential as a function of R is. So for something like gravity, Newtonian gravity, or Coulomb's law. You could write something like this. Where C is just some constant that's determined by what your, whether you're using gravity or Coulomb's law. And so in a future lecture, we'll see uh, what happens to our system when we do plug in the specific uh, potential into our effective potential. And then we're gonna solve this Lagrangian for the equations of motion. Uh, but for right now, the point of this lecture was to show you how we can deal with the two body problem and using the two body system, using the geometry of the system and the symmetries of the system, we can reduce a problem with six degrees of freedom all the way down to one degree of freedom. And that one degree of freedom problem is much easier to solve. And we'll see that in a future lecture. This has been a Dr. Strassbau lecture. Keep the credentials. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell for notifications.